Hi, my name is Mary Jewett, and I am an educator with the Lakes Environmental Association. My name is Alana Dowdy. I'm another educator with Lakes Environmental Association. And with the help of Casco Bay Estuary Partnership, we're creating this video to help you learn more about benthic macroinvertebrates. We'd also like to introduce one of our helpers today, Olivia. Hello! Here we go! All right, let's explore. So today we are at the Holt Pond Preserve and we are going to be collecting some macroinvertebrates from the Muddy River. Alana has already filled up our little bucket with some water and she's going to show us how to use a net to collect the macroinvertebrate. There's lots of ways to collect macroinvertebrates. Um, we're going to use a D-net. Is this a D shape right here? Perfect. So we're going to use a D-net and collect some of these insects and things along the bottom of the water. Now these guys, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but benthic macroinvertebrates can help us understand the quality of the water, which is just super cool. Different insects are tolerant to different levels of pollution, so depending on what we find, we can say, hey, this water quality is pretty good, or we can say, this water quality isn't looking so awesome. So to use a D-net, I'm going to walk out on this plank here and try and stay above the water, which probably won't happen, but that's okay, right? Here we go. So she's mucking around on the bottom, trying to get some good muck. And she's going to look for bugs in there. So Alana did her scoop, so now I'm going to uh, see what I can get out on the plank. Also try not to fall in. Oh, this sinks. It's sinking. Glad I got my boots on. I'm gonna try and go a little further out. We've got some nice vegetation in the water right now. So I try to kind of take out. Okay. There's something really cool in here. Alright. Let's see what we've got. Okay, so Mary has lots of stuff in her D-net here. Oh, you can see something squiggling around. Um, as these guys are out of the water, you will see more and more start to move around. And it's lots of debris, lots of leaves, as you can see. Let me get a better view over here. So she's going to scoop around with her spoon to see if she can see anybody moving. And if she does, she'll gently scoop them out with her spoon into the bigger tub of water. Once we've collected all the critters that we want, we'll start to put them into petri dishes. But first, here's Olivia. Here we have our bin with all our macros in it and some debris as well. We're going to learn more about what's in here. We pulled some out and put them in petri dishes, but first Mary is going to talk to us more about what a benthic macroinvertebrate even is. What does benthic macroinvertebrate mean? Let's break the words down. Benthic macroinvertebrate. You probably have an idea of what a couple mean, but let's get some definitions down so you can have a better understanding of what we're studying. Benthic means bottom. This is the area at the bottom of bodies of water, like this photo of a lake bed. Benthic macroinvertebrates live around and under the rocks and soil in this area. The BMIs you have seen in this video live in a variety of freshwater sources, but they are all found at the bottom of the water. Macro means big, and big is not a very scientific word. I am big compared to a dragonfly nymph, but a dragonfly is big compared to bacteria. Macro really means that you can see the subject without any kind of magnifying glass or microscope. They are big enough that you can identify them with your naked eye. Invertebrate means no spine. BMIs do not have internal skeletons like humans and other vertebrates. 
Instead, they have exoskeletons, which is an external covering that keeps the body rigid and protects the animal. Some BMIs leave their exoskeleton behind when they change into their adult forms. Dragonflies are an example of a BMI that emerges from the water to transform to a flying insect. They bust out of the back of their exoskeleton and leave it behind, slowly unfolding their wings. There are dozens of dragonfly species in Maine, each emerging at different times of the summer. Dragonflies can stand a small amount of pollution and lower water quality, and they can be found in many different freshwater systems. Many people call these skinny dragonflies, but they are a totally different type of animal, the damselfly. I like to call them dragons and damsels, like we're in some fantasy novel. Anyway, in this photo, the damselfly has emerged from their exoskeleton and crawled to the lily pad next door. Look closely next summer and you will see that there are many different damselfly species flying around. They stop to rest more often than dragonflies, so they are easier to observe. Not all BMIs have a terrestrial stage. This means that they spend their entire lives underwater with no time spent on land. Sow bugs, snails, scuds, and our favorite bloodsucker, the leech, are all benthic macroinvertebrates, with the leech being the only one with no exoskeleton or shell to keep its shape rigid. These are all on the pollution tolerant end of the scale, but we need to talk a little bit about what that means. Being tolerant of something does not mean that these animals prefer being in low water quality. Just because they can survive in a less clean habitat does not mean that they won't be found in higher water quality with the sensitive animals. So if you find a leech while mucking around in the water, don't assume that the water is polluted or dirty. An ecosystem with high biodiversity, this means a variety of animals from across the tolerance spectrum, also indicates that the water body is healthy. In order to know for sure how healthy an ecosystem is, a stream, a pond, or a lake, you need to look carefully at all the BMIs in that system, which is something you are going to do in the activity coming up. Thanks, Mary. Before we do our own bioassessment, we're going to have to figure out how to identify some of these critters. So this is a caddis fly that we found, and we found a few different kinds. And these guys are so much fun because they build their own little cabin around their body with whatever they have available. It could be sand or twigs, hemlock needles. One time we found some that were made out of duckweed, so they were bright green and swimming around in the water. So cool! Caddisflies are pollution sensitive, so we're only going to find them in super clean water. And sometimes they're in their little cabins, and sometimes there are free swimming ones. And if you see the ones that are out free swimming around, they have a little C-shaped caterpillar-like body. You might be able to see that in their little cabin. You can kind of see that that thing has legs in there and a little head, but maybe, maybe not. Let's see these guys swimming around. So you can see on the bottom here, this one, and then just above him there's another sort of crawling around on him, and then just to the left there's a little teeny tiny one. So cool! Here's another friend who's also pollution sensitive, the mayfly. These guys are called mayflies because they hatch in May, and they have these incredible feathery gills that help move the water around them and bring oxygen into their body. They have a really distinguished head, thorax with six legs, and abdomen. And this video, you can see, oh, it's coming up, how their uh, gills are moving. He's like hanging out on this snail, pulling all that um, oxygenated water towards his body. See those huge tails? I mean, this thing is really neat looking. Here's another friend, also pollution sensitive, the stonefly. And we're going to find these guys in rocky places, all right? Lots of well oxygenated, cool water. This guy's also pollution sensitive and that's why we find them in the best, highest water quality streams. Very clear head, thorax with six legs and an abdomen and check out those tails on there. Um, big antenna and to me these guys are like the incredible hulk of the macroinvertebrate world. They even do push-ups to move the water around their bodies to get oxygen in. And they have two tiny little claws you can see at the end of each leg. So some of these pictures, we didn't catch this guy today, um, obviously not in the Petri dish. And these pictures are from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection and our friend Tom Danielson there.
Here's one more pollution sensitive friend, the Dobson fly. And there are lots of other macroinvertebrates that are also pollution sensitive, but these are the ones we're focusing on here to get you all ready for the bioassessment. So the Dobson fly has a clear head, thorax in the middle with six legs, and I got Tom to send us the picture of it on its back so you can see those legs tucked in. And then this also has an abdomen with a series of filaments that look spiky. Those are to increase the surface area of the organism to be able to get more oxygen into its body. Are you noticing something here? All these pollution sensitive invertebrates that need high oxygen also have adaptations to be able to get oxygen to their bodies. Like the mayfly have the little feathery gills and the stonefly does push-ups and the dobson fly here has increased surface area on its body with these like alien filament things. So this also has the nickname of toe biter and in South America and maybe even down south in America these things can get pretty big. Here we don't have to worry about them too much but they do have little pinchers on their head so you know just be careful if you're handling a Dobson fly. The other nickname of this is Helgramite just to give you an example of how crazy these things are. Now we'll transition into some of our somewhat pollution sensitive macroinvertebrates. Mary talked a little bit about dragonflies already and you can see the head looks like a dragonfly head, right? They don't have any tails, they do have six legs on their thorax and a big abdomen. They even suck in water into their abdomen for this jet propulsion. How amazing is that? Just like Mary said, dragons and damsels. So here's the damselfly, also somewhat pollution sensitive. A different body shape than the dragonfly we just saw, right? A really long abdomen, but the head is a similar shape. The thorax with six long skinny legs again. And then those tails, which are pretty darn funky. That one's totally green. And then we have all different kinds, all from the same water body in this Petri dish. So really quite a variety here but you want to see that long abdomen and those two or three tails for the damselfly. Here we start to get into some weird looking macroinvertebrates. So some more somewhat pollution sensitive guys. On the top we have the black fly larva. Everybody loves the black fly. And if you look, so on the right hand side of it, there's these little suction cup thingies at the base of its abdomen and that allows the black fly larva to hold on to surfaces, different rocks or sticks or something so they don't get washed downstream. On the bottom is the crane fly larva and both of these guys really look caterpillary, wormy type bodies, right? The crane fly larva hatches into that huge mosquito looking thing that everybody freaks out. It's not a mosquito, it's not going to bite you, don't worry. Here's some scuds also pollution, somewhat pollution sensitive. These are like little shrimp swimming around in the water. Finally, we'll end with some more pollution tolerant critters. Mary talked about these guys a little bit already, but we can think about the less complex the body, the more tolerant they are of pollution. And remember, it doesn't mean that they need pollution, just means they can deal with it a little bit better than like the caddisfly. I'm feeling like you're in a pretty good place to start your bioassessment, so we're going to wrap things up. Well, that was awesome. Thanks so much for exploring with us today. I think we found some pretty cool stuff. So remember, uh, any freshwater uh, body of water is going to have some kind of macroinvertebrates in it. So anytime you go swimming or wading in a stream or canoeing on a river, there's going to be some of these animals right in the water with you. So. Uh, anywhere that you find fresh water, you can explore and find these bugs for yourself. You don't need a fancy D-nut like we had. You can use an ice cube tray or Tupperware or a little fish net, whatever. Just remember that these animals really like to stay in the water. So once you scoop them out, make sure you have a bigger tray to put them into and keep them safe. All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, that's dirty. That's quite slick. Okay, ready?